This is Jonathan Ferguson, the keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. In this episode, Jonathan's taking another look at the World War II era weaponry of Battlefield 5. That was the Volkssturmgewehr, people's assault rifle. So you would expect from that that it's an automatic weapon. And in fact, Battlefield models it as an automatic weapon. It is not. If you want to see our previous episode on Battlefield 5, make sure to check it out. We've got a handy link down in the description of this video. And make sure to subscribe as well, as we've got tons of content just like this on the channel, including Loadout, a show where we take a look at the history and impact of some of the most iconic weapons in gaming. From the shotgun and M1 Garand, through to the Desert Eagle and the minigun. We collaborated with Jonathan on Loadout 2, so he'll be making a fair few appearances on that show as well. But without further ado, let's see more of Jonathan's take on Battlefield 5. The well gun, those of you who didn't already know might have guessed, the well part of the name is from the same origin as the well rod. Why well? Well, well, well in Garden City is where Station 9 of the Special Operations Executive was based. And they were one of the stations that came up with all sorts of interesting bits of kit for James Bond types. And so this is the well gun. Gun in this case, meaning submachine gun, as you're all well aware by now. So they came up with something that was very short. You don't really get a sense of that in the game because the stock is deployed, which it should be when fighting. So if I can um, deploy this one without scratching the very nice blue finish on this, by the way, we can see the, uh, the stock unfolds, latches into place there, and the butt plate folds down and locks into place. So it looks a bit crude, almost like a Sten, but it's a bit more sophisticated in some ways. We have this whacking great open receiver, which strikes me as a tremendously bad idea. You can see this in the game. We're not modeling uh, unreliability in, in the Battlefield series, so not a problem. In real life, I think it might be, might be more of a problem. I don't know. Other than the short overall length and the tactical flexibility of a folding stock, this doesn't really do anything that a Sten gun doesn't do. You'd think if you were going to design your own Gucci submachine gun for sneaky beaky operations, you would get rid of the weak point of the Sten gun. The magazine became the weak point of the Sten gun. And it's, apart from anything else, it's dual columns of ammunition, but feeding from one column. They, they get smooshed together into one column for feeding, which is not ideal. It's a bit like being on the road um, and two lanes of traffic merge and if, people are nice to each other, let each other in like a zipper, it all goes well. But of course, human beings aren't like that and neither, neither is ammunition. So you get stoppages. That's the well gun. It's a really nice, important bit of firearms history. And it's, a, it's quite a nice mixture actually of crude bits of well that have been ground off and quite a nice bit of um, blued finish and quite a cool, almost sci-fi diesel punk look to it. This is another intriguing and very British Second World War gun. Vickers GO, not Vickers GO. GO standing for gas operated. It's unusual for a, for a firearm to denote how it's operated in its name, but in this case, it's because the standard Vickers gun was recoil operated from the beginning, the Vickers Maxim gun. So it was a handy way in it, within the naming system to denote a different type of Vickers gun. It's completely different, in fact. So the, the number one had a spade grip at the rear and was for mounting on vehicles and is sort of somewhat famous for being preferred by um, the original SAS, Special Air Service in the desert. And they, they liked this relatively compact, I suppose, high rate of fire machine gun, which was really designed as, a, as an anti-aircraft or, or mounted gun. The difference, as, as you see in the game and as you see in the one behind me, although the example I've got here is missing the bipod, um, is that they redesigned it. So the other mark was the ground service version. So it's got a pistol grip and a, and a more conventional butt stock, so you can actually get in and shoulder it, and a wooden foregrip to actually run around firing it from the hip, which is very sort of comic book and uh, slash video game slash movie, but that's the kind of people these guys were. Ideally, they'd be sneaking about and not engaging the enemy at all. But if they had to, much like some modern special operations forces, high volume of firepower to sort of break contact and, and get the hell away was found to be useful. Part of that is having a substantial 
drum magazine on the top of a gun to be able to feed the sort of the voracious appetites as it as it were of 900 ish rounds per minute which i think is about right in the game so the drum on this thing is 100 rounds which is really the minimum you need for a machine gun with that rate of fire What we've just seen there is one of several attempts to turn the, well, in this case, the short magazine the Enfield version of, the, of that bolt action rifle into a, a fully automatic gun, a machine gun. Of those um, three designs that I'm aware of, only one of them was used in the, uh, sort of was designed for use in the First World War. The, the others, the Charlton and this, the Turner, were produced as expedient designs. So a way to turn something common and cheap, Lee Enfield rifles, into something more capable as a support weapon. And so in this case, the, the Turner. Turner refers to uh, Russell, a Russell J. Turner, who was an American, and this was for the Canadian forces. And so by bolting a gas tube and piston to the, to the side of your, or otherwise integrating it into your Lee Enfield, you could turn a turn bolt weapon into a fully automatic one. And from everything I've read and seen, both versions were relatively slow rates of fire. And I suspect they've got it pretty right in the game there. And they have the, along with the Howl as well, they have very much a, almost a steampunk look to them because they look like an Edwardian rifle with all sorts of tubes and housings grafted to it because that's what they are. So firing the same cartridge as the, both the Enfield and the Bren, but doing it in a sort of Heath Robinson, Rube Goldberg way with gubbins attached um, to the rifle. I think the key difference with the Turner, which I'm not sure is really evident from, from playing the game necessarily, is that it wasn't so much just stuff grafted onto the side like the others. It was, you take the barrel, you keep the furniture, the wooden stock, and then you throw out pretty much everything else. I don't know, it's like keeping keeping the spoiler on your on your uh, Ford Escort and, and replacing the, the actual car with a Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're uh, still going to cost. It's still going to cost you quite a lot of money to convert your Lee Enfields. This is a uh, one of the occasions where I, I'm forced to grab the next nearest thing that we have in the uh, museum collection to what we're seeing. And that's because the M1917, um, so-called trench carbine, was a prototype. There the, would be a handful in the world. But what I'm holding here is one of the original run of C96 carbines. Um, the M1917 differs in quite a few details from this, but it's not really that different. They are semi-automatic, which I think is what we're seeing in the game. I don't remember or I haven't seen this thing firing automatic. I think you'd know it if it was because the very small lightweight bolt in the broom handle with the Schnellfeuer variants that are automatic, this thing absolutely rips um, at about 1,000 plus rounds per minute. This thing doesn't. This is semi-automatic. Um, so the, 90, the main difference is the lack of a detachable 20 round magazine. Now what we see happen in the cycling animation is just the bolt moving, I think I'm right in saying. As you can hopefully see from me compressing the, the barrel on this carbine, that's not actually how a C96 works. Yes, the bolt does come back, but much like a slide operated pistol, it's short recoil. So it has to start moving with the whole barrel assembly. So effectively the slide and the barrel move together as they do in a slide operated pistol. This does it with a bolt, with an internal bolt. So yes, the bolt moves, but the two are locked together for that much travel. It's not much, and it's so little that I might even be missing it in the game. I mainly don't think so, because the way they've attached the imaginary scope to this model, it appears it's attached to the barrel, which is a bad thing. You don't want extra weight slowing down the reciprocation of your barrel assembly. Admittedly, this already has that in the longer barrel. They will have factored that into the uh, geometry of the working parts. If you then weld on a scope mount in the scope, the scopes are heavy, they're made out of you know, steel and glass typically. That's liable to impact functioning negatively. It's going to impact accuracy because the sight is on a moving part of the gun. That's never good.
I don't know if it's me, but the the Danish Krag Jorgensen design used by Norway as well as Denmark. Uh, but it seems like the Krag is getting more popular in video gaming in the last sort of five years or something. I don't remember it being in anything, and then suddenly I'm seeing it in several several games. Uh, we featured it on this show before. Pro famous, if it's famous at all, for uh, its unusual loading system with the hopper, pseudo hopper on the side. So in the original design, you swung it open uh, from the rear forwards, and then you, you you put your rounds in one at a time into an internal magazine from the side, which is pretty unconventional. Can't think of another design that does it in the same way. It's noteworthy for that. It, I don't. It wasn't a particular advantage. I don't think it was a particular disadvantage either. So the Krag was moderately successful in the, in the grand scheme of service rifles. The Norwegian version, uh, which is what the American version was based on, changed it so that the hopper hinged open at the side. In, in both cases, when you when you hinge it open, it takes spring tension off the rounds. So instead of a, a follower with a spring pushing up from directly below, it's pushing up from uh, pushing in and up from the side. So by opening that up, you relieve all the spring tension, which means to unload, you literally just tip out all the rounds, and it would only be the one in the chamber if you chambered around that you'd have to unload with the bolt. In gaming terms, that gives us something visually different to to play with. I don't know if it may, might give you any sort of reloading advantage in terms of animation speed it doesn't look like it it doesn't go for the sort of dump in all five rounds at once slam it shut because after all this is meant to be a, a slow operating rifle because it's a primarily a sniping type rifle in the game speaking of which i have not seen i have limited experience with the crag admittedly but i've not seen scoped versions of the crag other than uh, sporting target shooting, hunting rifles that have been made from crags. Because you can drill and tap and mount scope to anything. There's no reason why it would be an impediment. And actually the crag is a good choice for scoping, in theory, because of the side mounted magazine. That was the Volkssturmgewehr, people's assault rifle. So you would expect from that that it's an automatic weapon. And in fact, Battlefield models it as an automatic weapon. It is not. Here is a real one and it has a switch, but all the switch does is go from fire, foyer, to safe. Safe disengages the trigger entirely. It has quite the recoil spring because it is straight blowback. There's nothing delaying or locking this shut. Uh, this just does it by the sheer weight of the bolt, which in this case includes the whole barrel casing. So that's that's it cocked. It's on fire. Gun goes bang. Gun cycles itself because it's got ammunition in it in real life. Um, release the trigger to the reset and, it, and you fire it again. It is a semi-automatic weapon. There is no way to make this full auto without filing some parts and changing some parts and converting it to full auto. So despite the name, it was not intended to be fully automatic, but it does embody the other aspects of the assault rifle. It's compact, not hugely light, but light lightness was not a huge worry. As long as it wasn't heavier than a service rifle, that, that was sort of good enough in those days. And it fires that intermediate cartridge, which is easier to control in rapid fire. Something that is relatively easy to use but is capable of a high volume of fire does make sense this is another of these last ditch weapons a uh, very important piece of history for for firearms anyway if you're making weapons like this there's a good chance you're going to lose the war uh, so th this is um in some ways superior to the sten but a little bit ambitious and a bit you know, too too little too late really Thanks as ever for watching, guys. We've got links in the description if you'd like to donate to the museum, to the Royal Armouries. But um, in any case, thanks very much.